if the shooting schedule had been like a week longer, we probably would have turned into a cult. Um, it, it was just the vibes were that good on, on, on that set. Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. Now, guys, today on the show, we have returning champion, writer-director Alex Lehman. Now, Alex has been on the show multiple times. His first time on the show, he was promoting his first film, Blue Jay, starring Mark Duplass. And I feel like we've kind of gone along the journey of his career because that was the very first major feature he'd ever put out. And now he's got his new feature, Acid Man, starring Thomas Hayden Church, and it's in the Tribeca Film Festival of 2022. So we get into how he was able to get this made, all the adventures he had while he was shooting it, COVID, almost getting shot at, and so much more. So let's dive in. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Alex Lehman. How you doing, Alex? <laughs> hey, thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming back, brother. I mean, you're you're one of uh, you're one of the OGs here at Indie Film Hustle. You were, I think, the oldest episode. The first time you were on the show, you were promoting a film called Blue Jay. I forgive me, I don't remember the episode, but I think it was in the hundreds. We're now closing in on episode six hundred. That's amazing. Show. Congratulations to you. That is <laughs> huge. It's insane. I appreciate that. It's insane. It's it's definitely a hustle, as you can tell by the branding. You have, uh, hats, you have shirts, you have <laughs> wall light, whatever that is. You've got it's everywhere. It's part of my life, sir. I don't have a tattoo yet, but uh, <laughs> that's next. <laughs> that's next. Please. But listen, man, I was telling you before we got on, man, I'm so happy for you, man. You've done you've done so well. I've had so many – the thing is I've, I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of filmmakers over the years. And you and I have met and we've, we've hung out a little bit. And, and it's just remarkable how your career has progressed because a lot of people who I've talked to, they don't have – they don't – progress that way so your 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 success story and that's why i wanted to have you back on the show to like let everybody know like you know he's he's done good he's doing good he's he's moving along he's telling stories he's building a career for himself so it's it's a pleasure just to be able to witness it from that point from when you like kind of were first beginning getting yeah. your feet off the ground with an amazing film by the way with mark duplass thank you and uh paul and sarah polson um but shouldn't but, we also talk about all the failures in between? <laughs> well, no, That's no, I mean. no. Come on. Yeah. First like, of all, okay. After the yeah. first, no, look, listen, let's just let's keep it real, Alex. After the first movie, Hollywood just brought the dump truck full of cash, dumped yeah. it in front of you, and then yeah. anything you wanted to do, they just said, Alex, yeah. just name it, and how much? All you have is time and money, and any star you want. So that's how it has been. No, so yeah, don't. I am. <laughs> no, I understand. There's been, I'm sure, for every one movie that you get made. There's 30 that get don't get made or really close to getting made or the money drops out or the actor drops out or, oh, I, this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. So, of course, there's struggle. Can I say but, it? Go ahead. It's a hustle. It, <laughs> you owe me 15 cents, sir. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so for people who didn't listen, I have the pleasure of listening to uh, our other episodes. Can you tell a little, everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got started in the business? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I... I uh... I was a cameraman and a cinematographer for for a solid 10 years, more than 10 years. Um, and that was just my source of income. And my career path was was being a DP. And even though I'd gone to film school thinking I was going to direct, I kind of, I don't want to say got sidetracked, but I'd found this passion of, of cinematography. And it also paid the bills. And, and then I did get a little bit antsy at one point, felt like I needed to make my own stuff. So I was writing some pretty bad scripts and, uh, and then I made a documentary called Asperger's or Us. And um, I connected with, with Mark Duplass on that one. And he helped me uh, get that one, you know, into festivals and get it out in the world. And then, and then he and I started, you know, becoming collaborators on a couple of things like, like Blue Jay and, uh, and Paddleton. So that's kind of, you know, it was, I kind of, 
in the suits and ladders of it all, I feel like, you know, being completely honest, I feel like I kind of hit that big ladder. Uh, your audience knows what suits and ladders is, right? That's not obscure. No, I, that's an obscure, <laughs> sir, you are old, sir. You are old. <laughs> if it's not an I, app, my audience doesn't know about it. No, I'm joking. I, uh, in the Mario <laughs> Kart, dating. I got the uh, magic star. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Pick whatever you got the lottery. You, you want, you won, you won uh, the lottery. You want a scratch off lottery ticket. The opportunity. <laughs> that I got was, was really big. And, you know, I mean, the, 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 the lesson I share with anybody is like the opportunities will come and you don't know in what form. And sometimes it's a huge opportunity. Sometimes it's a small opportunity. You can't really control them, but you have to be ready for them if they show up. And, you know, I kind of feel like I lucked out as far as the timing of ha- being ready and having the right stuff at the right time for, for when a guy like Mark Duplass said, you know, I'm going to open the door for you. So that's, that's it's- how that worked out. It's it's and it's interesting for for people that don't know the full story because we're kind of glazing over how you work. You were a, you were a camera op on a show. Uh, I forgot the name of it. The league. The league. The yeah. league. Exactly. The league. And Mark was on it. Yeah. And as every independent film, every any movie about an independent film being made, there's generally the DP or the grip or someone with a script in the back of their pocket that yeah. hands it to the star, which yeah. you didn't do. But he heard yeah. that you had made this documentary. Yeah. And the timing of that, it's exactly what it is. It's luck, right place, right time, it right is. product. Yeah. If you made that film three years later, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have that connection. So it those stars aligned, and then you Mark said, Hey, let's take your movie out into the world. Oh, and by the way, I love I, I just like hanging out with you and working with you. Let's collaborate on another project. And then that kind of starts that off. But what is interesting about your story, Alex, and, and please forgive me for blowing a little bit of smoke up your butt. Not too much. I'm gonna try to keep it to a to a minimum. Don't worry. Well, I'll bring you back down. I'll crash you yeah, back yeah. down. Don't worry. Yeah. But <laughs> the thing that's fascinating is that I, I know a lot of filmmakers who get those those kind of lottery ticket moments with those opportunities with those kind of either big stars or people who open the doors for them. But many of them don't stay in the door. Many of them don't have the chops to stay in the door. Many of them don't have the personalities to stay in the door because you can get a shot. You know it. You've seen, I'm sure you have a lot of friends that get, get, they possibly out of a lottery ticket situation, get a shot, Sure. but they, they either blow it. Their egos get in the way. Their personalities get in the way. Something happens that it's that's the end of that's the peak. Yeah. But you kept you kept that go, that thing going, and people are like, you know, I want to keep working with I want to keep working with Alex. I want to keep going this. So that's a lesson for everybody listening. Just because you get if someone opens the door, you're lucky enough for someone to open the door. That's when the work begins. Mm. That's not where the work ends. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree with that, and and I would say that um, for every success you know you have you. There, there'll be some more opportunities that happen. And like, did you get led into the party to a certain extent? Yes. But um, I don't know, just to mix metaphors, like I think every party ends and then there's going to be a new party and then you got to get into that one. And um, you do have to keep earning your way back. And it's, it's at least I, I do. And most of my friends, like we find ourselves constantly having to re earn um, our, you know, our worth. So there isn't usually that one thing that changes everything. Um, yeah. As, as the as the incomparable Miss uh, Janet Jackson says, "What have you done for me lately?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's basically this. That's basically the town. Yeah. It's like great. You have you won an Oscar. Fantastic. Now what? <laughs> and it should be though. You know, I, I right. It, it sucks because I'll, I'll be honest. They, they, there have there have been times where I feel like you know. Um, why you know why can't I just get the next thing made? I've just proven that you know I'm consistently making movies that are getting good reviews and that people love and blah, blah, blah. And yet, you know, I, I mean, I'd say two things. First of all, the, the landscape's constantly changing and I'm sure you've had a bazillion <laughs> episodes that have talked about, you know, the, the streaming and the whatever, everything pandemic, everything has changed and like what audiences want that's constantly changing. So a, there's that. Um, and so what you might be good at, is in for a moment and then, and then it's not in and like you have to reinvent yourself. That's, that's cool. That's fine. And the other thing is this town is full of such talented people. There's so many, there's not enough room for us all to constantly be making all the things. And, and so I, the way I look at it is like, you know, I, I get something made and it's fantastic. We so you know, it, it's fantastic for us. Uh, the project might not be fantastic, but uh, maybe it is, who knows, but, but we, um, we celebrate, we feel great and people watch it. And then it's back to square one. You get thrown on this pile of, 
billions of, 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 of talented filmmakers. That's maybe, maybe not billions, maybe just millions. I don't know, but so many talented filmmakers and, and it's back to square one where we're all trying to, to get something made again. And that's okay. The meritocracy does exist to a certain extent. And, you know, if, if we were, if we were benefiting from like our past successes too much, that would also be leaving the door closed completely for for that that filmmaker who's listening right now who hasn't made their first thing. So I like right. the fact that the, the door gets to stay open a little bit for them too. Absolutely, because you need it. I mean, that's the that's the business. The business needs to be refreshed with new blood and and all of that kind of stuff. Um, now I, I want to ask you. Now you've directed a handful of features. What in your in your opinion is the biggest challenge in directing uh, an indie or you know? non-studio or just like, you know, non hundred billion dollar franchise kind of film. What are these challenges you, the biggest challenge you think? I mean, I, I think the biggest thing is getting it made. I still think it's harder than, than making it. Um, I don't know that that'll <laughs> ever change. You're right. <laughs> to a certain extent. I mean, unless you're, unless you're playing at a, a different league uh, where the movie is going to get made, regardless if you're on it right. or not, yeah. That's a different conversation. But for most filmmakers, that's not the conversation. <laughs> well, because, I mean, it's pretty messed up. If you think about it, you're trying to convince somebody to make something that doesn't exist, that's never existed before exactly in that form. And they're asking you in that room uh, or on the Zoom, uh, so what is this like? And so you're trying to convince them to spend a lot of money to make something that's never existed before, but they don't have the imagination that you have because – they're not you. And so they don't exactly understand what it is you're trying to make. And yet you have to promise them that, you know, it, it, it will exist. You don't know exactly what it is, but it's going to be this thing that is, is, is just out in the ether right now. Um, it's, it's, it's not like building. I can't show you the blueprints. I mean, I guess I can show you the blueprints, but you know, everybody knows the difference between script to screen. That's why we have reviewers. That's why we don't, you know, uh, so we don't finish with reviewing scripts like that. The, the work is only getting started. And right. um, and so I think there's a lot of uh, fear and uncertainty. And so trying to convince people that, that this is the right thing to be made and it's going to be artistically uh, valid and, and you know, probably financially has to be valid as well. Um, those are those are some pretty serious hurdles. Now, since you've 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 been around the block a little bit, you've got a little shrapnel in you uh, from mm. the business over the years. Yes. Is there something I'm walking that, with a limp? You walk. Yeah, we all walk with a limp, sir. Yeah. Some of us walk with more than just that. <laughs> um, but is is there anything you wish? Is that that one thing that you wish that someone would have told you at the beginning of this conversation of you trying to be a filmmaker? To just go, hey man, keep an eye out for this thing. Um. I wish somebody had maybe told me uh, that indie financing is fickle and maybe most people that say they have money don't actually have money. No, stop uh, it. Stop yeah, it. Well, I'm naive. I really am. I'm sorry. I, I've, I've when, been when someone it. tells you when someone tells you I have I got a hundred thousand dollars I can put into this. You believe them. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go through the details of my latest films because they got made. And, you know, at the end of the day, I feel very lucky that they did. And the rest is is the rest and and the more i share the, the specifics with friends the more they tell me there's similar stories and i feel like the whole the whole world of indie financing is is a very comical place uh it's that's a euphemism comical uh mm -hmm. but but uh but i got lucky because my first couple of narrative features were with duplass right like mark was instant like if mark if we we're making the movie together he was starring in it he was you know able to pay for it um, and he had a, a distribution deal with Netflix. It was so turnkey. And so um, it wasn't until Acid Man, uh, which I you know, specifically set out to make on my own. My own is such a personal story. And I felt like I want to produce this myself and, you know, just really just take the full ownership. So raising raising finances for that one. I wish I'm glad I learned what I learned, but I, I wish somebody maybe had given me a crash course or two before before I headed out into that world. I just, the, the only, uh, there's just uh, two, two words I can tell you, sir. Verifiable funds. <laughs> <laughs> That's the two magic words in indie finance, verifiable funds. <laughs> they wrote it down on a, on, a napkin? on a napkin with a crayon and that was good enough for me. 
Yeah. For everybody listening, there are multiple uh, episodes about uh, film financing on the show, on the podcast. You can go back into the archives of, but two words, verifiable funds. But but here's why maybe that doesn't matter that you have those episodes and why maybe it doesn't matter that like I, where somebody would have told me is um, we we believe so bad. Of course you do. Of course you, you want to believe. Uh, and I've got friends in situations where they've come across some shady financing and then they try to tip off the next person who might get tied into that shady financing and say like, don't work with this person. Their money's not real. And the response nine times out of 10 is yeah, but he's our best shot. So we're going to go with him anyway. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like, don't, oh my don't, you know, it's like, don't get in the, don't get in the train. It's heading off a cliff and somebody goes, ah, I kind of want to go somewhere. I <laughs> You know what? And, and this is a, this is a deeper conversation because I was having a conversation with this film distributor the other day, and he I was asking him straight up. I was like, "Why are filmmakers always getting taken advantage of in film distribution?" And this goes for film financing as well. And he's like, "Because they want to believe." Because we're not business majors. Because we're but film not even majors. but not even <laughs> that but not even that part. Even if yeah. you're smart enough, because there's a lot of smart people I know in the business sure. who got taken. Because they want to believe because either yeah. at, your, at the beginning of the, of the situation or at the end. So film finance is at the beginning, film distribution is at the end. Both times, there's a lot of pressure on you to make something happen. You want to get your movie made. And then in film distribution, you're so exhausted that you believe anything that anybody tells you like, oh, someone loves me. Someone loves my work that I've been spending the last two years for. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's no MG. I don't need I don't need any money up front. Uh, 25 years. Sure. I'll sign that. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, OK, great. And uh, oh, five thousand five million dollar expense cap. Great. That's fantastic. But you want to believe. So that's something that it's it's hard. It's even when even if you know this information when you're in it's kind of like being in a bad relationship you know you're just like i I know she i know she's not good for me yeah but damn i can't quit her yeah i can change her (laughs) i can change her i can change her i can change her i can i can make i can make her i can make her better i can change her yeah uh that doesn't work out in film financing or in film distribution but but don't you think that probably the shady people that are pretending to have money but are really out there to like you know well, whatever, screw us over. Yeah. Uh, don't you think that they're also saying like, I can change, I can, <laughs> I could be a better oh, person. I think next time I'm really going to have that money that I promised the filmmaker. Well, I think I think those people are. I I, I think few, there are people who do go out there with malicious intent. I think other people yeah. truly believe that they're just they want to play the role of yeah. the the, yeah. the high roller, the I want to be in show business kind of vibe, yeah. and they they might have the intention of getting you the money. But sure. they just don't have the, the the capability of doing so. Yeah. But they just kind of roll the dice. They're like, oh, I'm just going to say I have the money so I can play. I can go along this train and have these conversations and pretend that I'm a, a filmmaker, a producer, or a finance, or so on. To I a mean, certain point, we're all doing that, though, right? To, like, we, like the, <laughs> the very fabric of filmmaking is we're trying to get people to, to believe in something that's totally made up. And we're, we're, we're taking them on a journey and we're saying this is this is a story worth it. Now, gather around, everybody. This is This is... Allow me to take two hours of your time, and it's going to be worth it. It's a story. It's it's uh, there's there's something romantic in that, and I I do think that. I mean, I don't know. I think that probably like like the real scammers are probably in other businesses because there's there's more money to be made scamming in in in. Oh, med- Medicare. Industries. Yeah, uh, yeah. More, yeah, scamming Medicare is a lot better, more lucrative than scamming independent filmmakers. Yeah, so I think I just, I think my heart goes out even to like the 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 indie film scammers because like at the heart of it, and you touched on this, like they want to be part of making movies, and like it's like I was gonna have to scam somewhere, might as well scam here and make movies because as a kid I always wanted to scam and make movies. <laughs> So just a disclaimer, everybody. I do not, I do not suggest you scam Medicare or any independent filmmakers. That's not part of what we're saying here. I'm just, we're just using it as an example. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you something, Alice, because you have been a cinematographer for most of your career, yeah. and most of the films you've worked on, you've been the DP. Yeah. But this one, you didn't. So, what was it like, Acid Man? What was it like not having the the controls of the lighting and the camera sure. and did you let loot did you how did that work for you as someone who's done it because as for me i i've been editing all my life anytime i've ever worked with an editor it, it's 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 an adjustment it takes a minute yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, Paddleton, I also wasn't the cinematographer. So that was the first one. But I, I'll be honest, I struggled on Paddleton to let go of those reins. And and the DP I had, he had, he had uh, shot second unit for me on Blue Jay when I DP'd that myself. So there was, you know, a little bit of comfort there. And he also had, um, he was very patient in, in, in my inability to completely let go on Paddleton. I'll say that the first day of Acid Man was still tricky, and I was still like kind of gripping onto that hat a little bit. And um, my my cinematographer John Matishak, uh, he he really got me there. This was a this was a cool experience for me because it was the first time that that just and it's very early on in the filming process. I just started seeing what he was doing, and I started trusting. And um, you know, I, I think it became clear to me that we were going to approach things differently. But I loved you know, the end results and that I just needed to trust, you know, the process until I would get to see the end result. Cause you know, otherwise it's like instantly I just start looking at like where somebody puts a light and I'm like, well, that's not where I put the light. Um, it's totally subjective, but you know, to, to, to keep my <laughs> mouth shut, uh, as both a, I think a very good collaborator, but also a control freak. And that's, uh, I think you're supposed to have a little bit of both of those, uh, to direct. Um, I, I was really excited to be able to let go. Funny story about John. He literally shot my first short film in college. That's how long I've known him. Oh, and, wow. um, we didn't, you know, we, he, he went out to Nashville for, for a while and was shooting commercials and, you know, was raising a family out there. So he didn't come back to LA till, um, just a couple of years ago and we reconnected and he was saying like, I want to get back in the indie feature game, you know, um, move, move in LA with my family. I really want to make movies again. And, uh, that's how I reached out to him for, for acid man. And, and, you know, he was fantastic. And, uh, and I've, you know, I've been using him since, uh, and, um, it's, it's so freeing not to have to think like a DP much anymore. We can still have the conversations in the shorthand, but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. I felt the same way. It's like when you like, oh, and I see a, an assemble cut of something I did. I was like, oh, I didn't have to spend six hours to get that assemble cut done. Oh, that kind of feels nice. <laughs> I just could come in and, and tweak. Oh, that's feels a little bit better. <laughs> Well, and here's the good thing, whether it's editing or cinematography, cinematography yeah. a little less because you, you know, you only have a certain amount of time and resources. Sure. But, but to say, you know, I've got something in mind, but before I take us down that path, what are you thinking? Let me see what you're thinking. It's like you only have one opportunity to really see how right. your, your collaborator artist sees things before you, you know, smother them with your vision and ask them to like, try to understand what it is you want. And there's a curiosity I have when we have the time, it's like, what did you see when you read the script? Or, you know, what are you feeling in this moment? Because um, I, I know what I'd like to do, but I might be able to learn something from you. And, and, you know, as, as much time as we have, and, you know, as much exploring as we can do, I, I'd love to do a little discovery before we go down a path. And by the way, I might still say like, that's really interesting. And let's shoot that. But then the shot I really need that's been in my mind's eye, since the first day I wrote this is this shot over here and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get both of them and figure it out later. Uh, but sometimes I abandon, sometimes I say, that's cool. That's, that's more interesting than what I was going to do. And, and, and thank you for challenging me. And that takes time to allow yourself to be uh, confident enough in your own skin, comfortable enough in your own skin to allow that the ego starts yes. to, pull back a little bit and you, and you, as you get a little bit older, you've been around town a little bit longer and doing this, you realize you're like, best idea wins, man. Best idea all wins. Ego. You're right. It's all, it's all about ego or, or hopefully lack of ego for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now you've, you've had the pleasure of working with some amazing uh, actors, some, some, some legends, you know, Ray Romano, Duplass. Now you worked with Thomas. I hit in a church in um, an acid man. How do you approach working with actors of that, of those, of that kind of caliber? Cause I can imagine it might be intimidating working with someone you might have like with Raymond uh, or, you know, having him working with him, um, Ray Romano, not Raymond, <laughs> uh, but Ray Romano, but like working with someone like that, that you might've been watching him as you grew up. Like, how do you approach the, the, uh, the relationship? Of, of a director actor in that scenario? Well, I like to start out, um, you know, uh, exchanging some really vulnerable information about each other so that we both feel, you know, and then I uh, blackmail them. 
for the rest great of the technique. show. Yeah. Great technique, guys. Great you were, you, picture. Yeah. Photos work. Photos work. Yeah. If you could get photo, <laughs> you were you were in their trust, and then you weaponize it against them. Um, no, the first part's true. Um, I, I, I would say more, even more importantly, I mean, when when you ask yourself, especially if it's somebody who's a little more legendary, who's been doing who's been doing so much, who you know is getting ten offers a week. You know, Sarah Paulson, uh, Ray Romano, Thomas Hayden Church. You have to ask yourself first, like, okay, why, why are they, why did they choose this project? And and I think it's a really fair thing to both ask yourself, maybe their reps, and 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 ask them, what is it that you're that that draws them to the project, and really make sure that you're honoring that. Like, if there's something that they came here specifically for, um, as long as it falls within the 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 scope of what you're trying to make with the film make sure there's there's room for that if if Ray's like I always you know comedic and I want to make sure that like I have the opportunity to really you know show the world my dramatic chops don't make him say a bunch of dick and fart jokes like let him you know <laughs> really build it around those those moments that he wants and in return he'll you know he'll give you the goods and and as far as Thomas goes you know I, I wanted to understand how why he was drawn to this and 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 understand what you know what what excites him um because obviously the paydays on these smaller films is not what makes these people leave their their home when they made all that '90s TV money. I uh, mean, listen, listen, Thomas. Thomas just got off of uh, Spider Man, uh, the latest Spider Man. Uh, so I'm sure he's okay. He's okay. <laughs> he's okay. Uh, but, he's okay. But you know, but he the things he 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 did for our film that he you know he's willing to put up with you know the the lack of trailers, the limitations that we have. There's obviously something there, and and you know for for him it's. He was finding um, the character of Acid Man really relatable. He was honestly, you know, he was he was saying like, "I'm I'm becoming more of an Acid Man myself all the time." Uh, which, you know, for your listeners, I should say this this character is, uh, you know, he's a reclusive, very intelligent man, but a reclusive guy who lives in this small town and uh, is is kind of he just kind of keeps to himself and he he tinkers, you know, he's got some of his own hobbies and some of his own his own interests and beliefs, and he's maybe not. Where he's definitely not understood by by the town or, or really by anyone. He's just kind of minding his own business, and um, and you know Thomas had been. I mean, the pandemic didn't hurt, but Thomas felt like he'd been living in, in his little ranch house a lot lately, just not not feeling as motivated to to connect with people, and and started to like feel that distance grow. And he was saying like, what what's that about? Why am I comfortable with this? And like is this uh, going to continue? Like, like, is this pattern going to continue where like, maybe I stop returning people's phone calls completely at some point. Let me explore these feelings with, with the character of acid man. So, you know, making the room for, for Thomas to explore those, those elements, that was really important. Um, and then adapting to his process was really important. So he loves to find the character, you know, everything that's beneath the page. Um, and so we had, uh, so many long phone calls with himself and Diana Agron, who, who plays his daughter. The three of us had like, you know, on, on the weekly, just like maybe two or three phone calls that would last a couple hours each. And this, this went on for months. Um, and we just really dug beneath what was, you know, the, the script and, and found these characters. And that fits my improv process anyways. But it was really about like, this is this is what makes Thomas excited. It's like building out a character and fleshing him out. I mean, it's it's easy for me to give that when that's something I want as well. But um, but yeah, I would say to answer your question in a roundabout way, uh, you, you you figure out what it is they want. And you make sure that they get to have it. That's why they showed up. Now, can you tell me how Acid Man, your new film Acid Man, came to life? Yeah, so that's that script I've had since we were taking Blue Jay on tour, promoting Blue Jay. Um, it mm -hmm. was, yeah, this is a it's a very personal story. It's something that I started writing, you know, way before Paddleton, and um, I don't really think I was ever going to make it. Certainly not after Paddleton. It just kind of felt like maybe the opportunity had come and gone for for this movie. 
Um, and the, the, the character of Acid Man, the name Acid Man, there's actually this guy, you know, in the small town where I grew up, his, he, he, he was probably schizophrenic, but, but, you know, like the kids had a nickname for this guy, he would walk around the town and he lived with his parents, he was probably in his thirties and they would like throw eggs at his house and spray paint stuff and they'd harass him and call him Acid Man. The mythology was, you know, he'd gone on a bad acid trip and, and never came back. And I think a lot of towns have... Mm -hmm their own acid man, right? Like I've usually like everybody, you know, I like, think like people go like, Oh yeah, like we had Charlie on a lawnmower. Or we had, you know, our guy dressed up like Abraham Lincoln and would walk around. Town. Sure. Like, and, um, and I, I was always really curious about that, that man when I was young and about how, what his relationship was with our town. Like, you know, we, it's just weird to me that like we could just write somebody off and kind of harass him. Even the adults call them the walking man. It just felt very, um, you know, I think we fell short of, of, of really respecting that person. And, um, and I, I think probably loneliness and, 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 you know, searching for connection are, are themes that have kind of been throughout all of my films. And, um, and so I was, I was always kind of connected to that character. And then the, the, the ultimate question of like, what if, you know, you're estranged from your parents or your father and you reconnect with your father who used to be this uh, brilliant scientist, really intelligent man. This, this, you knew him as one person and then you reconnect with him and he's become the acid man of his town, right? Like, and, and, and so I think some of that's obviously just exploring um, the aging, you know, our parents and who they become and who will become mm -hmm. one day. Yeah. yeah, that's um that I was telling you earlier, I was as I was watching it, it was connecting with me at a whole other level because you know, when you're 20 and you watch a film like this, you're like, oh, that's kind of yeah, this or that. But when you're you know, I'm I'm getting close to 50. <laughs> I don't like to even say that word, but I, I'm a few years away still, but you know, I'm getting to that age and you just start thinking about things a lot differently. You start thinking about life differently. Where am I going to be in 20 or 30 years? You definitely have more behind you than you do ahead of you. Sure. And that's a very strange place to be as a, a person. And it's, and I think they do call it a midlife crisis, though I'm not getting a uh, Corvette anytime soon, but, uh, and I love my wife, but, um, but it was really interesting the way I, I, I really attached myself to not only the acid man as a character, but the daughter and seeing hit her father through his eyes. And I still, and I have my parents still. So you start looking at them and, who they were when they were, when you were there, a young man or a young, you know, a boy, a little boy, a little girl and who you thought they were and who you, who they become later in life. And it's, it's fascinating. And then I started thinking about what my daughters are going to look at me in, yeah. in 20 or 30 years, like this crazy podcasting filmmaking guy who made some movies and hung out with some stars or did some this and, or did that. And like, and then like, and now look at them, uh, just living off all that crazy podcast money. But uh, <laughs> but it was just very fascinating. It was really, I mean, again, it hit me at the right place. I'm your demographic, sir. So it was, it was really touching. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to explore those blurred lines because you don't, there's no day that you just say like, all right, you know, um, I was a child and you were an adult, you know, to your parent. You don't, you don't say, there's no day where you say, okay, you're no longer the, the parent and I'm no longer the child because I too am an adult, uh, you know, and we don't say that to, to, to our kids either. So it's just kind of, you. End, so at some point you're a child and you're a parent. Uh, so that's weird, right? Like how can you be both? But I mean, you are, look at you, like you are, you're, you're a dad, but you're, you're a son as well. Right. And, um, and it's, it's no secret that at some point we lose a little bit of um, either, either faculty or, or just like some strength in life, you know, as, as we age, uh, or at least we don't necessarily have the same qualities and strengths that, that our society may be, um, right. uh, virtu you know, honor, right? So, so uh, or respect as much. And so um, there's this kind of softening of, of where older people go into and, and what, how do you say that? How do you say like at some point, like, well, you're my, cause at one point, you know, you said my, you're my parent. I look up to you. I mean, when you're really young, you say like, you're, you're my parent, you're a God, mm -hmm. you're, you're, there's nothing wrong with you. You could do no wrong. And then there's everything in between. And then we get to a certain age and we're like, Oh my God, my parent can't, 
is incapable of anything. And, and uh, that's a horrible feeling, you know, to, to try to somehow tie this same person who is a god to you as this person who now needs help with everything. And, and so I think Acid Man to a certain extent is, is, is an exploration of that and trying not to rush into um, pity uh, or, or, you know, right. resentment for the things that we don't understand and also just honoring um, the fact that those connections never, never go away. Like to a certain extent, you'll be your, your, your parents' child no matter how old you are. Oh, um, my, my kids will always be my kids. I don't care how old they get. I don't care how successful they get. I don't care how big they get. It doesn't matter. I don't care if they have kids themselves. They will always be my little girl, like girls. It's just, just you can't look at it differently. Just the same way my parents say the same thing to me. Yeah. You know, there's, I'm like, I'm a grown ass man. She's like, yeah, you're still that <laughs> little kid I grew up, I, I raised. Yeah. And it's, you, you just, you know, until you're a parent, you don't get it. Uh, you might intellectually, but when you actually see a child or if you have, you know, children in your life in some way, shape or form, you start to understand that a little bit differently. It's, it is, it was a, a meditation in, in parenthood to say the least, this, this yeah. project, man, it was really, really cool, brother. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'd say if there's one other theme that, that I could share, and I don't think it's a spoiler really, cause it happens early in the film and we'll probably have to mention it anyways, but, but mm-hmm. so this character, uh, you know, acid man who. It's really referred to just as dad in the film because he's he's Diana Aaron's dad, uh, a strange father. Uh, his name is Lloyd, um, and he he has this obsession with UFOs. He's got these he sees these blinking lights out in the sky, and you know he just really feels connected to them. But he he's a believer in this stuff, and um, you know I I just the the other the other thought really in 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 writing this was like what if you're trying to like reconnect or just connect with your parents. And like, now they're into, you know, QAnon or whatever it is that they're into. And you're like, how the hell do I reconcile the, the differences in beliefs and opinions that I have with this person oh. that I love and I respect, but like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to talk about that. You know what? I, I don't, I don't want like a political film and like, sure. I don't even want to like piss anybody off at QAnon. Although it kind of feels like it's going away. It's, but, it's fine. <laughs> we can we can move on, sir. It's okay. I must. I should have checked with you first. Are we are we good? Did I I, just... I I believe in Q, and um, any day now. No, I'm joking. Uh, whatever people Alex believe Ferrari is Ferrari is Q. <laughs> you heard I have first. I heard yeah. it here first. Listen, whatever people want to believe is it's up to them. I could care less. Yeah, and that you know, and that's that's I guess that's really what what the the film is about to a certain extent is like. Um, if whatever you want to believe that doesn't hurt anybody and that, you know, and that doesn't cause harm, like those, those kinds of beliefs, like I could just ridicule you. I mean, we have opinion, we have opinions of everything and like, you know, extreme opinions of everything. It's all we do. And, uh, and, and so for me, it's an exercise to show patience, uh, with someone who believes in, in something supernatural that doesn't have any like, you know, evidence. Exactly. Well, well, obviously, but we did see the the congressional hearings. So UFOs obviously <laughs> are, are real. They're there. We've seen videos now. I want them to be real. I hope we all do. We all have seen yeah. movies. Come on, the filmmaker. Yeah. You have you watch that. You want that situation yeah. to be real. Listen, regardless of if UFOs are, real, I do believe that this is just my personal belief that in in this giant universe there has to be some life somewhere. Mm-hmm. Have they visited? I don't know. I, I just knows? don't know. But. Logic dictates that there's billions and billions and billions of planets out there. Probably something happens. Something's got to be there. Something's got some, some sort of organism somewhere, even if it's a small, something has to be living somewhere else on, in, in this universe. But dude, I know, hope ET is roasting marshmallows in my backyard tonight. Like really I do. Thank you, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> you know, but it's, but it's, but it's so very true, but it's really fascinating too, because that concept of not being able to connect and you did it very eloquently too because ufos is just one of those things you're just like fine so it's not a political statement but being able to connect with someone you love whose blood who has wildly different views on certain things and it could be something as madonna Madonna, uh, Madonna, i can't say the word uh as um, madonna yeah. Madonna, Madonna, she's Madonna. Very, she's no. very polarizing these days. No, no, no. Uh, benign, like yeah. believing in UFOs or not, because I heard really yeah. nobody, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it's something very deep, either either in the religious world or in the political mm-hmm. world or whatever it is, it's so yeah. difficult to connect with someone you love because you still love them regardless 
of their beliefs and where they were because they weren't there maybe 30 years ago. So I think you you danced that line so eloquently and beautifully in the film that you said what you needed to say about that idea without really, really stepping on anyone's toes, unless uh, the UFO or lovers. I, well, I appreciate it. I mean, even the UFO, I mean, I think at the end of the film, we don't know if that was a UFO or not, but, but, uh, yeah. but, um, yeah. or, or maybe we do. I'm not going to tell you. Exactly. Um, <laughs> sorry. The movie's about more than that. Uh, I didn't give anything away, but, but, um, I would say that, that, uh, e- I, I think maybe the reason it works in the film is because I wasn't putting it on anybody else. I was really putting it on myself to um, find more empathy and, and compassion and curiosity for the people who have different beliefs than I do. And right. instead of even just saying like, well, I don't believe that, but good for you to say like, well, I mean, what do I know? I'm just another person. And, you know, we're all wrong about plenty of things. So let me be a little more curious and let me respect this and let me figure out why this is you know relevant to you and when you hear someone talk about whether it's their religion or or you know a a spiritual belief they have or ghosts or aliens or anything you you listen to them enough and they do start talking about something that is like a little bit more grounded and more personal anyways um like we got this great story when we were when we were scouting um for acid man we were on this like you know mountaintop uh overlooking you know the oregon rogue valley and um and this is like random guy just like walks up on us and he's like oh you guys making the, you you're the ones making the movie here uh it's about ufos or something we're like oh you know we didn't want to like, tell him too much but he's like yeah and and <laughs> he starts telling us about you know the ufo sightings that he's had and you know this is you could you could at that point validly say like here we go like this guy's gonna you know be but but you know we just kept listening and um first of all the stories were really entertaining and made me want to see what he had seen and and the second thing is out of nowhere he starts talking about um the the passing of his father who his father had died just a few years ago and was telling us about how he still talks to his dad every single day and that he's never really brought that up to anybody and i'm thinking like holy shit he just used uh ufos as a conduit to talk about his feelings about his deceased father and he's a guy who's maybe I don't know him, but he's maybe not as emotionally vulnerable and capable of talking about that stuff all the time. And I don't think UFOs were created in his mind or a substitution for for those feelings, but they certainly made it easier to talk about certain things. And so all of a sudden it was this really generous uh, connection that we had. You know, it's interesting that a lot of people get so caught up with everything that's going on right now or in our lives right now. In a hundred years, what does it matter? Just be kind to people. Mm-hmm. Be kind, try to help people as best you can, man. Yeah. That's the way I look at things. Like at every moment in time, humanity thought they had everything figured out. Yeah, it's not till next week. I mean, every, at, at, every moment, at every moment, there was yeah. a moment where the earth was yeah. the center of the universe. There was, when it was flat. Sorry, yeah. flat earthers. Uh, <laughs> there's, you know, there was, there's always, everyone's got to figure it out. So yeah. when you understand that, like, yeah, maybe we've got a couple things figured out. Maybe we don't. Maybe in a hundred years or in five hundred years, they're going to be looking back at us and like, "Can you believe the barbaric two thousands and twenties? Oh my god, this is crazy!" Well, I do think for uh, uh, let me get back. On, I'll just get on the the soapbox for one second. I do think that probably in a hundred years, people are going to say the shit that they allowed with homelessness. Was oh no. Like, it's going to be, you know, it's 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 going to, you know, the the the, the way we look at, at certain things that happened a couple hundred years ago uh, today, I think people are going to look back and say, like, wow, they just didn't give a shit about all those people. That's weird. Um, but, hey, you know, it was the dark ages. It was the it was the early Internet ages. Like, they didn't know how to be people. They weren't humans. They were... They were, they were they were getting all this information, but it was all bad information, and anyone could write any information they wanted they were, to on the internet. Basic, and, basically, cavemen. They were still they were, at the, you know with, with podcasts. They were with, cavemen yeah. with podcasts, with obviously. Laptops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I think you know, I think to, to the whole to the point of like of like, yeah, what does it all matter in a hundred years? It, there, there's, there's obviously there's a lot of fighting going on now. I mean, it's been going on for a while, but sure. Um, man, I don't know. It just feels like a lot of people are wanting to feel heard right now and there's so much noise and I guess we're contributing to it with, you know, making a, I mean, a movie, now I'm doing <laughs> interviews, but so I'm making more noise, but, um, 
but I don't know. I, I, I just think the practice of, of, of listening to people and making them feel heard, we could, we could probably all heal each other a little more just by, by replacing some of the shouting over with, with listening. I, I, I'd agree with you a hundred, a hundred percent. Now to get back to the filmmaking side of this, this mm-hmm. movie, what there, you know, and I, I don't know if I've asked you this on any of the other shows, but it's a question I've been asking lately. Okay. We all go through uh, every day. There's always a, when we're shooting it, when we're shooting a movie, we're on, on set. There's always that day that everything goes to hell. Mm-hmm. Lost the sun, the camera breaks, the actor can't make it. Something happens where you have to completely compromise. Uh, what was the worst day of this? <laughs> besides every single day, besides every single day, what was the yeah. worst of every single day yeah. Yeah. of that situation? And then how did you overcome it? Okay. I, there's, there's a, of course there are a couple moments and I, I just got to think about which one I can share the story without publicly. <laughs> well, yeah, publicly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I will say that the filmmaking experience and this is either going to piss people off or they're just not going to believe me, but it was such a positive experience and it was, just you know it was like may of 21 so people were just starting to get their vaccines and just kind of coming out a little bit there was such a everybody was so excited just to be on a set together and i don't know just the nature of what we were doing it enabled everybody to just be vulnerable and really lean in that um like I, I like to joke that if we had if the shooting schedule had been like a week longer we probably would have turned into a cult um, it, it was just the vibes were that good on, on, on that set. And that's been on happens really, all the time. Happens I, I've, all the time. I've all been on some time. really positive sets though, but, but this one, you know, really, this one, this one was special. Um, but, but sure there were, there were, you know, there was an angry neighbor, uh, at, at one point cause we had to drive <laughs> through a private road and, you know, this, those Oregon private roads are, uh, people move to Oregon to be left alone, usually. Now, I'm not talking about Portland. I'm talking about like country. outskirts. 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 That's where we were shooting. It was very apropos for for Acid Man, and the neighbor uh, was was well known. He was infamous for for shooting at cars that drove too fast on the on their private roads. Uh, I don't think that anybody got shot at, but we we definitely were confronted on a certain day where we were shooting. Um, a really emotional scene and he came he just came in screaming at 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 some of us and uh you know he just you just don't know i mean and this is honestly this is scarier than anything else because you just don't know like does this guy have a gun like is this is he mentally stable sure yeah 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 and so like diffusing that situation and then also recognizing the fact that it's going to um emotionally shake everybody when you're asking not just the actors, but especially the actors to, to be vulnerable because that's, you know, that's what we're, we're doing. We're making a film. I mean, if we'd been making an action film, maybe it would have like pumped everybody up, but we weren't, we were making a film where people were trying to shed these layers and not take each other down, but, but, but like connect and bring each other. And to do that, you have to put the armor down. And so when a guy comes onto your, property and screams and you think he's got a gun like everybody wants to put that emotional armor up like i wish we had real body armor to be honest it's a little nervous but um but yeah so i think really just recognizing everybody's feelings and just kind of like emotionally making the transition from stuff like that which yeah we lost it we lost you know a half hour and like for you know for a second there's some logistical stuff and you got to keep the day going for sure but but i think crew morale and and just really making everybody feel safe is is so important i agree with you 100 percent. it's a good answer sir there's always there's always that day there's always that thing there is always it's, that and day. there's always that day there's always that thing yeah. uh, now what uh, and you got into tribeca obviously because you're in the, you're where this is our tribeca coverage so yes, of sir. course i always like to ask what was that phone call like because you haven't been in tribeca before or have you um, I had a doc series here um, a couple of years ago. The Aspergers, um, we, had, we made a, a doc series with the uh, Aspergers troupe, um, and that's on HBO, and we, we premiered it at Tribeca. Um, but that was, you know, that was before the pandemic. Um, it was right before the pandemic. It's like, what, 12 years ago now? Um, <laughs> 15 years ago, yeah, 15 yeah, years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it doesn't really count. Um, but but this is the, yeah, this is the first narrative film that I've had at Tribeca, and 
um, I'm, I'm super excited. It's, you know, I was talking to my DP about this the other day. He said, isn't it cool? Like there was like, we were essentially like a crew of 15 people like living out like in these, in the like, woods. <laughs> in these cabins, in these woods, making this film. He's like, isn't it cool that we're out in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, like just 15 of us like doing this, this thing. And now we're premiering it in like the, you know, one of the biggest cities in the world, you know, like this, this huge, you know, festival. now, now I, a little birdie told me that you have uh, something else coming up uh, at the end of the year. You shot not just one film, but two back to back. Can you yeah. tell me about your next project coming out, man? Yeah, so so Acid Man, I thought was going to be my movie last year. This is my coming out of the pandem- pandemic movie. And this other film that I'd been attached to for a little while, all of a sudden kind of pulled all the actors and all the money together. And so um, I basically shot these back to back, which was crazy. But uh, there's this film, it's called Meet Cute. Um, and it's starring Pete Davidson and Kaylee Cuoco. And um, I'm super proud of it, and um, you know, we'll have we'll have more details soon. But I think you know everybody should be looking forward to seeing it at the end of the year. And uh, it's it's kind of a it presents as a rom com, um, but it's a it's a really great script by Nogo Noelli. It was on the blacklist uh, years ago, and um, it, it it devolves it twists into some other stuff. Uh, there's UFOs it, involved, obviously. There's there's. Uh, <laughs> Close, close. It gets, <laughs> it gets weird, man. But uh, but it's it's funny. Is it like Michelle it's... Gondry weird? Is it like Michelle Gondry weird? Or are we? Yeah, it, it's like weird. Michelle Gondry weird. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So that nice. one of his films, his most famous film, is definitely one that we used as a comp. And uh, I don't know. I'm just I'm I'm really excited about what that is, and I think Kaylee does an amazing job in it, and and you know Pete does an amazing job in it, but. I feel like I'm lucking out because with, with acid man, you know, I think Tom Hayden church is a, is an amazing actor. He oh, crushed it. the acid man that, you know, his, 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 his acting in this film, you know, I just, everybody keeps telling me they, they just, they love this side of Thomas that they haven't really gotten to see. And then I think Diana Agron was fantastic in it. She was a creative collaborator, you know, on it from the very beginning. I mean, I should say that like she really helped me put this all together when, um, you know, uh, I'd been I'd been used to you know just going to Mark Duplass and saying, you know, lucky me, I could just call hey, Mark up. Hey, and say, hey, like, hey, Mark, I, I got an idea. I let's go, let's go make this. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and so you know, basically calling calling Diane up and saying like, I, I've got this movie and I, you're you're perfect for it, and you know, could you help me? You know, if you sign on, I think we can get a really great actor and 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 some money, and you know, I just really need you to be behind this and. She's been behind it from from day one, you know, creatively and logistically, and and you know, someone like that when they when they give you that confidence and when they when they stand behind you, you know, they give their stamp of approval. That's a great way to get something made. Um, that's awesome. She delivered in every way. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing your new movie at the end of the year, and uh, and I tell everybody to go see Acid Man. It's really just really interesting meditation. I look at this very much as a meditation. You sit there and just absorb it. The cinematography is gorgeous. The performances, they're just going to wash over you. They're, it's beautiful, man. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions uh, that I ask all my guests. Yeah. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Yeah, I would say um, keep, keep, doing, keep being yourself. Keep doing you. Um, I see a lot of filmmakers trying to be uh, another filmmaker right or you know trying to make their version of well yeah, make your version of something but make it your version of something don't don't try to make the carbon copy of whatever movie it is you love and um, right. i think that the sooner they discover themselves and don't try to be anybody else the the, the 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 more quickly audiences will be able to see their authentic filmmaker self now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life that i don't know because I think I'm still learning that mm-hmm. every, every time it's kind of a cop out answer, but it's kind of not like, like, cause you, it, it, you, you have to know certain things. And then every time certainty creeps in, I, I, at least for myself, I, I have to take a step back and say like, all right, dial it back. You know, it can't, can't be too certain of anything because there's a lot of learning left to do. Yeah. And three of your favorite films of all time. Three of my favorite films of all time. Um, Okay, I'm going to start with what is, I think, a uh, a cousin to our film is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, I think we share a lot of the same emotional and thematic DNA. 
Mm-hmm. Um, slightly different budget. <laughs> even even the seventies budget is still slightly different than today's slightly budget for this. Budget. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, there's there's a there's a real connection there. And uh, I would say four hundred blows is is a big one for me. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, I could try to like dig deep and be cool, but Jaws, I'll just go to Jaws because <laughs> I've, I've never seen anything more than Jaws. It's like, what are, like, I don't need to impress anybody. Jaws, done. Jaws, it's, it's, I mean, it's a masterpiece and it still holds. It yeah. still scares the living hell out of you, even now. Like, it doesn't, I mean, the shark might look a little janky, but even then, it doesn't look that janky. I mean, nah, Jaws 3D great. looked much worse than Jaws 3D. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the shark at least. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna be. You know what? I'll be a uh, Stan. Is this? I don't know. Stan. I think is the. I'm gonna be a, a Stan and uh, a Spielberg Stan and say ET as well. Like it's too many Spielberg movies for a list, but like I don't. I don't care. ET because you say it still holds. Like that movie still. Like I oh, cry. E. If I need to cry, uh-huh. I'll watch ET. Uh, my 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 daughters were traumatized when ET was found down at the river. Traumatized. Wait, like what? they watched, they oh, couldn't. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When they when he was down at the river and he's like dying. Sorry, guys. Sorry, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen ET, if you're listening to this, you haven't seen ET. I'm sorry. Um, but when he's down there and they were like five or something, we showed it to them at five or six. Traumatized. They still talk about that. They they love the movie, but they just remember the image of ET because they loved them so much and like oh, it was a, it was an emotional roller coaster to say the least. <laughs> I I don't know how to explain this because it's going to sound like I'm pretty dumb that's okay maybe it's right uh but but when you said that uh they found et by the river my mind immediately went to like et lives like in a van down by the river now like <laughs> that's where his career that's where his career is ended up i was like what like we got to start a gofundme for et like i literally went there first and i'm not stupid i know i know he's fake yeah, I know he's dumb, but I was just like, oh, no, man. that's a mess. No, because I saw it in your ET face. Can't. I saw it. I saw it in your face when I said it. It took you like like a five or ten seconds, and then I saw you click. Oh, he means that scene in the movie, yeah. but I didn't know where you were thinking about. Thank you for <laughs> my my mind went a few places because first it was like, oh, maybe maybe uh, you know, like there was like a, a stuffed ET, like maybe like the 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 universe, whatever, right? Like the the actual. E.T. puppet that they use in the movie somehow got dumped by a river and like kids no, found there was a, there, there's a scene in the whatever. movie. Yeah, yeah, I know. I remember the movie. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. But like my mind, my mind did not choose the path of logic. My man, my mind, it chose the path of illogic. E.T. lives in a van down by the river. <laughs> That's amazing. That is that's Smoking amazing. cigarettes, drinking Smoking cigarettes. Like, <laughs> the times are tough. He, Sp- Spielberg and him had a falling out because they couldn't get the sequel up and running. He's hanging out there with Roger Rabbit because Roger Rabbit couldn't get the sequel either. I mean, Elliot, as an adult, one day drives by and he sees him and he like looks away, trying not to make eye contact because he's like, I don't even know how to like help approach him approach this situation. <laughs> Still <laughs> feeling too guilty to like. It's like fuck, man. We should. We should listen, man. Can't help ET. Can we, can we can we get a Kickstarter going right now for ET the movie? sequel? We'll we'll, we'll yeah. call up we'll call up Henry Thomas see if he'll come out and do it for us. <laughs> Man, I really know how to take the blockbuster out of a blockbuster. <laughs> Turn it into a meditation on <laughs> stardom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alex, man, it is a, it's a pleasure. First of all, you have the the best first name ever. But other than uh, that, sir. Um, it's a pleasure talking to you, brother. I always love catching up with you. You're welcome back anytime. I look forward to seeing your new movie at the end of the year. Thank uh, you. Please come back and tell us about how that. I'm sure you have insane stories about how that very, got very made. different story. Very different and story, you know, yeah. and hanging out with some. I mean, two very big star. I mean, these are monster yeah. stars right now. And and Pete Pete's a little well known now. Yeah, <laughs> in the world, he's in the news for something. I think he's living in a van down by the river. I'm not sure. I think we should uh, we should do a GoFundMe for for Pete because I think he just got he just left Snatternet Live. It's, I mean, he's he needs help. Poor guy. By the way, say, one thing I'll just say really really quickly that uh, that I'm proud of that maybe is worth sharing with your sure. your your audiences. Uh, you know, the budgets on Acid Man and then the new one Meet Cute very different. Um, and it went from like middle of nowhere Oregon crew of 15 people to you know shooting in Manhattan. Uh, I, you know, same DP, same, I brought over as much of the same crew as I possibly could. Anybody that was available, um, that, awesome. that had, you know, held their own on, on the smaller film. There was no FU. I'm going to go hire the, 
the 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 bigger version of you like i'm not gonna i'm gonna get whoever i can you know whoever did sandler's last movie whatever no i wanted to work with the same people and and i would say that that's good advice you yes. should have said that that stick mm-hmm. with the people that you know that, that you've been succeeding with you know uh have their back you know they've had yours for long enough agreed so, agreed 100 yeah, i'm really yeah really proud of of the team that that i made both of those movies with yeah Alex, a pleasure as always, my friend. Continued success, and uh, you're welcome back anytime, my friend. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. Congrats to you. Thank you, my friend.